So now I'd like to welcome our speaker, a well-kent face locally, Ian Gray. At the start of the first coronavirus lockdown, very nearly a year ago, Ian signed up to Facebook as an aid to communication, starting with making videos of performances of poems and moving on to posting photos illustrating his daily walks through Celadike, Anstruther and further afield. This became a major project with an important spin-off taking photos of people as a historical record of the pandemic. Thank you, Christine. To make the talk easier to manage, I've split it into themes. And I start with one or two examples of what we are missing because of the coronavirus crisis. The first picture that you, that you see is of some musicians playing in the boathouse in the Sunday Social, which I photographed some, some years ago. Uh, we meet every Sunday, or we used to meet every, every Sunday in, as part of the Sunday Social. And the next photo, this is the, the second uh, picture here, is of the musicians playing in the Haven. And the next photo is of a wonderful Burns night that we had on the 25th of January, 2020. We had no idea that we were going to be faced with uh, a coronavirus within a month or two. The first uh, item that I actually posted on Facebook was a poem titled Horses by the great poet from Chile, Pablo Neruda, in translation by the Scots poet, Alistair Reed. And I give it to you now. The poem is called Horses. I have Pablo Neruda, translated by Alistair Reed. From the window, I saw the horses. I was in Berlin in winter. The light was without light, the sky skyless, the air white like a moistened loaf. From my window, I could see a deserted arena, a circle bitten out by the teeth of winter. All at once, led out by a single man, ten horses were stepping, stepping into the snow. Scarcely had they rippled into existence like flame, then they filled the whole world of my eyes, empty till now. Faultless, flaming, they stepped like ten gods on broad, clean hoofs, their manes recalling a dream of salt spray. Their rumps were globes, were oranges, their colour was amber and honey was on fire. Their necks were towers carved from a stone of pride and in their furious eyes, sheer energy showed itself, a prisoner inside them. And there in the silence at the midpoint of the day in a dirty disgruntled winter, the horse's intense presence was blood, was rhythm, was the beckoning light of all being. I saw, I saw, and seeing, I came to life. There was the unwitting fountain, the dance of gold, the sky, the fire that sprang to life in beautiful things. I have obliterated that gloomy Berlin winter. I shall not forget the light from these horses. It's a beautiful poem. My hope is that the themes of the photos I have selected will tell you something about our part of Fife and the people who live here. To give you an idea of where most of my walks took me and where the photos were taken, here is an aerial shot of Sella Dyke and Anstra the Easter taken by Graham Johnston. Sella Dyke Harbour is at the top of the picture here. George Street, where I live, is here. At the top of the picture, you can see Kilrenny, and this is the Crail Road. Here is the Marches, Banky Park here, the Watery Butts here, and St. Ailes Crescent Playground. This is where most of the, of the photos took place. The first theme is one of my favourite walks from Seven George Street, along George Street to the harbour a very short distance, in fact, about 800 yards. 
here are some of the things I see and think about in that short walk. This first picture is of poetry Peter. He was born in 34 George Street in 1874. He wrote many poems about the fishing industry in Celadike and performed them with great vigor in many places in the East Nuke of Fife and elsewhere. This photo of him was in 1951 at the age of 77. The next picture is a large bush in a neighboring garden, the home of the sparrows of George Street. Here they are. I'll give you a poem of mine about them later. Here is an old gate, used to be the, the next point of interest. It has recently been removed as being beyond repair. Beyond that is the George Street Garden, where 44 George Street stood at one time. When it was demolished, I don't know. And that takes us to the Harbour Rockery, which bloomed from spring through summer to autumn, gladdening the hearts of everybody who passed by. And the view then opens out to the harbour itself and Harbour Head. I know this walk so well, but I find new things in it every day. And here too are three shots of the harbour to give you an idea of its constant change. First, the swirling water. How much it swirls depends on how the weather is outside in the outside the harbour. And I managed to catch two women caught diving in, a very popular activity here. And the final picture in this section is the harbour pier on a rough day. My second theme I've titled Responding to Requests, prompted by a message from a former diker, Sue Collins, living in Vietnam at the time. She asked if someone would take and post a photo of the path with steps that she used to run down to get home to number three, the Cooperage. And that's this green door here. And that's the whole path which I walked down. There's not many steps on it. There's a step here, for instance. And here is the position of the path above, I think this area is called the Braze above the Toons Green, which was actually uh, donated to the, to the town by Captain Roger of China Tea Kip Kipper fame. Some Celadite people actually traveled the world. I often get requests for me to take photos of front doors. I love getting requests. For instance, here is one request. You have photographed many front doors in James Street, but not number 17. So along I went and took a photo which I posted. I don't know why I had not photographed it before, to be honest with you. I rather like the inscription on the door, making waves. Another example is a request of someone who had planned to move into a property in Skeeth Road at Easter 2020. He asked me to photograph it for him in its incomplete state which I did on the 24th of May, 2020. Later, on the 27th of August, I photographed the completed house. I love doing projects like this. I got many responses from people for this kind of thing, and I became a well-known figure in Celadike and Enser as a result. I come now to see theme three. One of the things that impressed me as I walked through Celadike was what great gardeners some people are and how imaginative some people are in their creations. First, I would like to introduce you to a path which Hugh Barnett created at Six Urquhart Wine, which I discovered when I walked past an open gate to his garden. He created this path from fossils he discovered along the Fife coast. He says it took him about two months to create it. And here is a close-up of one image on the path. Just imagine the amount of work that he put into creating it and the amount of love he must have put into it as well. Second, I would like to show you some of the displays of flowers in Celadike. 
Take a look at Jim's garden in Fowler Place. Just think of the work involved in creating it and the amount again of love too. I met him about two months ago and he told me how much pleasure he got from creating it. As a complete change, here is Renata's garden at Harbour Head. A most remarkable garden, I think, full of interest. In summertime, you see Renata actually sitting on a seat just about there. I'd also like to show you another example of flowers in Celadike. This is Hugh and Gladys's tubs by Urquhart Wine. On windy or rainy days, Gladys actually covers them, them up. And I can't resist showing you the best kept wheelie bin depot in Silver Dykes, perhaps in Fife, perhaps in Scotland, perhaps in the whole world. Cre cared for and created by Anne, who is very proud of it, as she should be. I'll be showing you a picture of her later on. Third picture in this session, one meal that I much like preparing is pesto genovese. And I like giving pesto in jars to friends. Here is one of the jars which Fiona McKenna has decorated with the ingredients of pesto. Here, for example, is garlic, olive oil, pine nuts, I think that's parmesan cheese at the back there, and, and basil. Fiona actually lives in Anstruller, so it's not right to call her as being part of Celadite, really. And here are my ingredients ready to make pesto. I bought the mortar and pestle in Genoa many, many years ago. Mortaio e pestello. Clive and I have pesto, I think, at least three times a month. I've even written a poem about it, how I learned about pesto when I was working for a large firm of international public accountants in Italy. And I give it to you now. It's actually titled Ian's Pesto. Well, Anita's really. And you'll find out why I said Anita's really. So here is the poem. This is a tale of a discovery, which became an important element in my life, altering as it did my perception of the nature of good food. The place of the discovery, Polanzi, a small village on the Ligurian coast, 10 miles east of Genoa, overlooking the Golfo di Paradiso. Anita, proprietor of a greengrocer's shop, was the agent of my discovery, being amazed to learn that I had never heard of basilico, that most fragrant herb. We communicated in her Genovese and my halting Italian. Her question, have you ever tasted pesto? Admitting that it was unknown to me. She said to the whole shop full of locals, this man has never heard of pesto. Should I help him? Their assent was enthusiastic, clearly keen on my schooling. She took a paper bag and into it she put basilico, basil, prezzamolo, parsley, aglio, garlic, parmigiano, parmesan cheese, and pinoli, pine nuts. Thrusting a marble mortaio and wooden pestello into my hands together with oral instructions for making pesto. Do you have olio? and spaghetti at home. Yes, I told her, and she said, put these ingredients into the mortaio, and pestate, 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 pound, 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 before adding olio and salt to taste. Cook the spaghetti al dente, add the pesto, it is the best meal in the world. And it was indeed the best meal in the world joining in companionship other best meals. This was a defining revelation which altered our diet even on our return to the UK. But finding that fresh basil was unobtainable, we grew our own on windowsills. At that time in the 70s, it was difficult to find garlic in local supermarkets and olive oil was only to be found in small quantities in chemist shops. 
for a purpose unknown to me. But today the ingredients are all easily found and spaghetti al pesto has become a regular and welcome meal, often for guests who are overwhelmed by the taste when first meeting it. They say, oh, Ian, Ian, your pesto is the best in the world. Och, say I, trying to be modest but failing. Well, Anita would be proud of me. Though she might not like the cream, I add, to make it easier to coat the pasta, likely saying it is not entirely authentic, not the way the Genovese would make it, not the way that I would make it. Still, my pesto, really her pesto, though modified, adds to our happiness and to that of our friends, a symbol of harmony between nations. I really do like pesto, I must say. My fourth theme is titled, What I Learned During My Walks. As I walked over Seladijk and Anstruther and as far as Kilrenny, I learned a lot about places I had hardly known before and some of the history of our lo locality too. Much of my learning came from people who commented on the photos that I was posting sometimes prompted by me asking questions in response to their comments. I can only give you a few examples. This is a photo of Orchid Wind, which I often walked up and down, and was, in, was informed loc locally that it was known as Screw Wind. Why, says I, there was a water supply at the top of the wine and a screw that you turn to get access to the water. So we called the wind screw wind. So I went up to the top of Urquhart Wind and I found the place where the screw used to be, or perhaps it's even there now. Another example is the house covered in shells in Anstra the Wester on the Pit and Weem Road. When I called it Shell House, I was immediately reprimanded for not calling it Bucky House. Bucky being a local name for shell. As people got to know me better, they suggested places that I could visit. Such a place was the Egg Box House, which is a listed building standing in Hadfoot's Wind in Anstruther and visible from Thomas Chalmers Memorial Garden. Its special feature, which gives it its name, is the row of concrete shapes at the top of the wall, which has been constructed using egg boxes. People gave advice as to where I could stand to get the best view. It was good to get comments from people. For instance, there is a row of posts at the entrance to St. Ao's Crescent Playground. One of my <clears throat> commentators or friends on Facebook said that this photo showed how the attitude of society had changed over the years regarding the quality of objects in the environment. Look how the oldest posts and the second oldest posts are designed compared with the more unadorned modern ones. It was lovely getting comments like that from people. I was also very taken by this view looking at Burnside Terrace in May 2020, liking the curve of the buildings. But one of my correspondents noticed something else, the number of chimneys on the buildings. There are, there are indeed many chimneys in Saladike. It must have been a very smoky place. Several times, I took the track over the fields from the marches to Kilrenny. When you near Kilrenny, you meet an erect stone. Here it is, by the track, known as the Skeeth Stone, with markings that are believed to be of Pictish origin, dating from the 7th century. Quite often, a picture like this would prompt a search, search by me on the internet. So I was learning all the time. By May 2020, I was becoming a well-known figure in Saladike and further afield. 
instantly recognizable by my tartan cap and my walking stick, originally my grandfather's, bought by him on the 25th of January, 1937, so over 80 years old, and my brightly colored Colombian bag. This bag was actually given to me by a Colombian chef who was demonstrating his cooking in Edinburgh some years ago. And people started talking to me in the street, sometimes admonishing me for going too close to the edge of the harbour. Or going out when it was raining. And I'd like to introduce you now to some people I met during my walks. I, I meet so many people, I can't possibly show them all to you. But here's a young boy who I saw jumping like this into the harbour. And I went up to him and I asked him if I could actually photograph him. And he shouted across to his mother, Mum, Mum, this man wants to photograph me. Is it all right? And she said, yes. I think that's an amazing picture. He took one, ran to the harbour and leapt in it like this. It's a really good photo, I think. But sheer luck, I must say, in actually getting it. Some of the best photos you make actually you get because of a lot of luck. And here is someone who I call an old friend, who I talk to every time I'm at Harbour Head. Most people are afraid of him, but he's generally misunderstood. His name is Roderick, by the way. And he's very friendly to me every time I go up there and talk to him. And the next photo, is of two men replacing the March stone, which was being continually knocked down by some unknown person during the summer. I was able to advise them on how the stone had stood beforehand. This mark had to, had to face west, for instance. And I'd like to introduce you to two other friends of mine. This is Aileen, and this is Anne. Anne is the person who actually looks after the Queedy Bin depot in Silver Dykes. They're neighbours. And I first came across the Queedy Bin depot because Aileen saw me passing her house, came out, took me round to the back and showed it to me. Called me Ian without no, me, me knowing who she was in fact. And the next couple are Tommy Morris and Elizabeth, two very well-known Dikers. When I posted this photo, there were many comments which showed how highly regarded they are in the community. Tommy is actually the uncle of Scott Morris, a friend of ours, a very, very good photographer, who died sadly uh, three or four years ago. And I'd like to introduce you at the end of this section to Jake. Jake is one of the artists of Celadike, who opens his studio as part of East Nuke Open Studios every year. And he's got with him here Sprocket, his daughter's dog, so-called because her husband is a motorcycle freak, and Sula. And it is Jake and Sula that I meet on most days when I walk along George Street. One of my walks took me frequently past the children's play area on the five coastal paths and the pool. The pool is a really beautiful place, as I think you would agree. There is often a lot of activity on it here of kayaks, but I'd like also to bring you to Christmas Day 2020, where I met four so-called mermaids who are marshaled by Linda Thompson here, before taking to the water at sunrise. Here is Catherine and Deborah, Linda and Leanne. I think they're completely crackers actually myself, but they seem to enjoy it. And on New Year's Day 2021, I met eight mermaids who again were going to go into the water at sunrise. And here they are in the water. And as you can see, it's at sunrise. 
is supposed to be very good for you actually going into cold water like this, but I wouldn't do it myself. They seem very happy about it and ignore my opinion that they're all out of their minds. A number of us use Strava to record our walks or runs. If people like what you've done, they award you kudos to show their appreciation. And here is one that records a walk I did in May 2020 to the end of the Anstruther West Pier. I started off at 7 John Street here. I walked along John Street past the town hall, along James Street to where Saladite becomes Anstruther. And then I walked all the way along to the end of the pier here. And here are some of the things that I saw. There's the white lighthouse at the end of the Anstruther West Pier. This I call the Red Lighthouse at the end of the Anstruther East Pier. And this is the Outer Harbour. From there, I walked through the centre of Anstruther completely deserted. It was actually just before seven in the morning when I took that photo. But later at the height of the day, it looked very similar during the, cop the first, cop uh, first lockdown process. I walked along that road, of course, and I came to the start of the pier, which you can see was pretty deserted at that time. And I eventually re reached the white lighthouse at the end of the pier. And I was able to read the plaque on it. You can see that it's actually called the Chalmers Lighthouse in memory of Thomas Chalmers. But the locals don't call it that. They call it the Hannah Harvey or the Hannah Hervey lighthouse, uh, lighthouse because she was the one who actually financed it. We had a big discussion about this on, on Facebook, led, I think, by Richard Weems, I seem to remember. And this is me starting to walk back. And it's a lovely view, I think, of the centre of Anstruther from the, from the West Pier. This is the outer harbour, and then here is the inner harbour. So I walked all the way through the centre of Anstruther again, until I reached East Green. And I must say that I really like taking photos of posts that stretch into the distance like this, or anything that stretches into the distance. In this case, with a row of shadows as well. And the final photo is my sign-off. This is a plaque that my wife Dorothea uh, had attached to the house at the time in December 2004 when she opened her studio for the first time as part of East Nuke Open Studios. She was good enough to add my name to it, as you can see. I used to do quite a lot of work actually putting her pictures up, by the way, so I think I actually deserved it. But I always finished all of my walks by saying, and back home and showing a local view like this one. A number of photos that I took, I described as caught my eye. Often little things that you might pass without particularly noticing them. And I'm going to show you now some examples. Here's a filled in window in John Street, prompting a discussion on window tax. And I was amazed when I actually saw this as an old mango, which has clearly seen better days by Banky Park. Looks as if it's had a hard life, but it's now a conversation piece. And the next one caused me to pause as well. It looks as if these cables are actually being held up by the hedge, the very carefully manicured hedge, I must say. And it certainly wasn't the hedge that was actually holding them up. I also took a photograph of these metal plates at uh, Seldyke Harbour. I just like the shape of them on the ground. I think there's something, something to do with the sewage system. Another photo that I 
really like taking, in this case, a tree with its reflection on the wall. One of my correspondents asked me if uh, I could, if she could paint it. And I said that she could. She hasn't done it yet, but I'm hoping to see it before long. So Lizanne, you could probably get down to it. The next one is a seat or a bench on the five coastal path. The husband of one of my correspondents used to sit here admiring the view, including the May Island again, of course. He has recently died, but she now decorates the bench with flowers in memory of his life. I was also fascinated by this tree in the inner court off East 4th Street. I had no idea what it was called until the householder came into the garden and told me it was called the handkerchief tree. So called because, because the leaves and flowers look like handkerchiefs. And they certainly do. It's an amazing sight. I'm looking forward to seeing it come into leaf in the spring of this year. One of the things that impressed me as I walked through Saladike and Anstrava was the quality of the equipment in the children's play areas. So let us take a look at some examples of what I saw. You often saw parents swinging their children in this dish-like thing. And children were clambering over these things and clambering through things as well, while their parents sat here drinking tea or coffee out of a thermos flask and keeping an eye on their children. And the next three photos I took in Banky Park. Here's a place for children to clamber over as well. And these ones here too. I was really impressed with how imaginative, imaginative the equipment is in both East Saladike and in Banky Park and how well constructed the various pieces of equipment are. Now, sometimes I walk with others. One walk I did was with Demi Forsyth through one of the woodland walks from near the War Memorial to Windmill Road. And the round berries in 2020 were very prolific. And I'm sure the birds were very happy about it as well. And here you can see Demi walking back along Windmill Road. And there you can see the woodland walk behind her here. Another walk was one I did with, did to Kilrenny with Fiona McKenna, which I illustrate with a Strava image on Fiona's iPhone. We started off at uh, 7 George Street here, walked up past the harbour, past the Toons Green, along the coastal path, up to a track, up to the Trail, Crail Road, down to Kilrenny, through Silverdyke Park, back to the War Memorial, and 7 George Street again. And here are some of the things we saw. Instructions for us all to smile, 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 smile by the tunes green. So we smiled. And here we've left Saladike. We've walked along the coastal path here, and we're just on the point of walking up the track to the Creole Road. Really beautiful thing to look at, actually, seeing, the, the, seeing Saladike in the distance like this. We eventually reached Kilrenny, and then we walked back through Saladike Park, and eventually arrived at the War Memorial here, and a view over to the May Island again. And here's Fiona admiring the view. I really like walking with others. Anyone who would like to do so with me are invited to apply, as long as they realise that I walk at about one mile an hour and I don't like going over difficult terrain anymore. I now move to Silver Dykes, which is a new 
development built within the last 20 years. This is the Crail Road here, and this long road here is Windmill Road. One of the things I wanted to do when I went into the, the Silver Dyke housing estate, which incidentally has really uh, increased the size of Silver Dyke enormously, with the different things about it that I found of interest. For instance, there are, this is, this is a, a, a road for, for cars and so on, but there are many paths like this for pedestrians and for cyclists in, in Silver Dykes, linking one part of, of Silver Dykes to another. And there are also many of these round features spread out through Silver Dykes. On the other side of, of this one, and, and on every one, there is a plaque which commemorates the fishing industry, very important over the years in this part of Fife. I tend to call them roundels. Some people call them towers or monuments, but I don't think they're very towering or monumental. So I think roundel is probably a better name for them. I was also interested to see that the residents of Sewer Dykes were taking pains to create a pleasant environment in a development which is relatively new. So I'm showing some of the features which makes the place a better place to be. This shook me a bit when I first saw it, the model of a plane in somebody's front garden. And here is a corner. See these trees and shrubs here really improve the environment. I think this is, this is Fairhaven Crescent here. And I think this is Acorn Court at this point. And I thought this, rather formal garden was of interest as well. It's another one in Fairhaven Crescent. I was really interested to see that people were actually taking pains uh, to create a pleasant environment in the place that they lived. I now move to Pickford Crescent. Pickford Crescent was uh, a development in the 1960s. And this is a uh, Strava image that I took of one of my walks to it. This is Pickford Crescent here. But I walked from Seven George Street past the harbour, up to the War Memorial, down a track to Windmill Road, and then round Pickford Crescent. This feature here is known as the keyhole, because seen from the air or on maps, it indeed looks like a keyhole. And here is Pickford Crescent from the air. Now here are some of the things you see when you go into Pickford Crescent. Here is the entrance to it. This is Windmill Road here, incidentally. And here is a feature, Dykelas, which commemorates the fishing industry again. Now, I told you that um, Pickford Crescent was actually built in the 1960s, so it's old enough for mature, to find mature birch trees in their gardens. And here's a, a display, the people, some, something in people's front garden, tortoise to amuse passers-by. People in Pickford Crescent love their fishing, love their wishing wells. This one cared for by Ayn, Ra Ayn Raper, who defends it like might and may. Beautiful flowers as well. And this is another rather formal garden, but it's a formal display, I have to say, full of interest. I loved seeing how people make their place interesting to visitors to Pickford Crescent and inhabitants too. And I used to comment on this feature when I posted them. Now every morning when I wake up, I open my window and I take photos of what I see out of the window. What I do is to take 
one photo 15 minutes before sunrise, one at sunrise, one 15 minutes after, and another 30 minutes after. Now I'm going to show you three photo, uh, four photos of views from my window. May Island is present all the time, of course. And I think this cloud formation is quite amazing. I was quite amazed when I saw it. And here's the sun actually rising and again. Now, of course, although Sal Dyke is well known for its stunning sunrises and sunsets, on occasion, the ha rolls in and you get this. The May Island is out here somewhere and this. The point is that you can't have it beautiful all the time, you know. I move now again to the Sparrows of George Street. Here first is a birthday present I got from Grace, daughter of Esther, me in the caricature of a sparrow. You can see that the sparrow in this case actually wears a tartan cap. I was really happy to get that as a present, I have to say. The others are photos of sparrows going about their business in George Street. Here they are, trilling away on the gutter. Here's a couple of them on their home bush. And here's three of them on the pavement or in the gutter of George Street. I came to like them so much that I wrote a poem about them titled The Sparrows of George Street. And I'm going to read the poem to you now. The Sparrows of George Street by Ian Gray. Halfway along George Street to Selldyke Harbour stands a large bush in a neighbouring garden. A bush tightly knit and home to a colony of sparrows who greet me every morning as I pass. Their conversation with each other, and perhaps with me, is a furious cacophony, a racket that makes me wonder, what are they saying? What does this clamour mean? This chirping and trilling, and it seems messaging too. They have chosen well the place for their colony. The bush is so tightly woven that no cat can win through. So their young, helpless when born, are safe in the early days of life when they need constant parental care. As I pass the colony, many birds perch on the top twigs, their feet perfectly designed to make perching secure. Others are on the wing, singing as they go, while some are perched on the gutters of George Street, making hullabaloo. They do not possess grandeur, my sparrows. They are not impressive or possessing great dignity. Just small, plump, brown and grey birds with short tails and stubby, powerful beaks, useful for cracking seeds. But their noise is joyous and makes their daily presence known. Pater Domesticus is the scientific name of the house sparrow giving its name to Passerine, the family of small perching birds. Passer domesticus, a good name to describe such common birds. Their tumult is surely about who is today on nest cleaning duty. Sparrows, indigenous to Europe, Africa and Asia, are naturalized throughout the world and are the best known bird of all. Do the sparrows of George Street know of their far-flung relatives? Or do they care only for their restricted territory in Saladike? Early every morning, I leave the house expecting to hear the pandemonium, the babble, the boisterousness, and the hubbub of the sparrows of George Street, and I'm never disappointed. And so my day begins, cheered by their liveliness and good spirits. Now, I couldn't actually cover everything that I'd seen during my walk. So I'm going to give you one or two pictures of places that I, that I visited 
but I couldn't actually demonstrate at length here. This one is in Banky Park. And notice here, of course, the area is maintained to encourage wildlife. Wildlife, a very good thing. And this is watery butts. Its name suggests dampness, and it was in fact at one time a very damp place. But when the Mayview Flats were built, it dried out. And it now is a, a little park and a children play area. And here is Bill and Ness, which I often walk, walk past. And you, from here, you can also see Pulpit Rock, where Thomas Chalmers used to preach on a Sunday. And this is the Anstruther War Memorial. I used to walk to, through, through these woods. His name escapes me all of a sudden. But the path is actually very difficult to, to negotiate in places. And this is the drill walkway, which starts off near the drill, drill tavern. And here's the bowling green, which I used to walk by quite often. Very, very carefully kept, I have to say. And here is the Fife Coastal Path. This is actually the furthest point that I could reach these days on the, on the coastal path to Crail. There's a high wall beyond this point, which I can no longer negotiate. At one time, I used to walk long distances every day along the coastal path. In fact, I've walked four times from Dundee over the Tay Bridge, Bay Road Bridge to over the Forth Road Bridge to South Queens Ferry. Most of job. I used to take photos while doing that, and I've got a huge catalogue of them at home. I now move to a pro this project, which I think Christine mentioned at the beginning. We decided that we should make a catalogue of people who had lived through COVID lockdown as part of a historical record. I can't show all of them. I, I think I took about well over a hundred pictures of uh, people standing at their front doors. So I'm only showing eight of them here. This is Nick holding a guitar. It's actually his birthday today. So happy birthday, Nick. I didn't, we didn't notice the wheelie bin was standing there as well at the time. He's a very good guitarist, by the way. And here is Kayla and Fiona and Paul. They actually live in Anstruther, but they perform so often in the Haven in Serotide that we decided to include them. People in these photos are all smiling, by the way. And that was because I told them, I said to them before I took the photo, look, you're, you're surviving lockdown, you're very happy about it, and I'd like you to look contented when I take the photo. And here's Elizabeth. She used to run the Cross Nest in Fairhaven Crescent. And here is Mary and Colin in Venus Place. And here is Linda, one of the mermaids, and Craig standing in, at the door in, in their garden. They actually own the Boathouse. Nearly, that nearly escaped me as well. They own the Boathouse, where all our great evenings take place. And this is Shona, who is smiling so beautifully, Shona. That's quite amazing. She actually opened Ensta Delhi uh, during the lockdown period. And here is Christine standing at the door of the corner shop. The corner shop is a real resource in Saladike. You can even take your dry cleaning here and they'll take it to St Andrews for you. And you can collect it when, you, when, you, when it comes back. And here is Linnea and Graham. Graham is the one who did all those aerial shots that I actually showed you during the talk. It's also his birthday today, by the way. So happy birthday, Graham. 
Well, I'm reaching the end of my talk now. I do hope that I've given you some idea of our part of Fife and the people who stay here. It's been a great pleasure for me to actually give this talk. And indeed, it's been a great pleasure for me to do these walks over the past year as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. That was really interesting. So, as I mentioned before, we've got time for a question and answer session now. So if you've got any questions, you can either type them into the chat box at the bottom of the screen, or if you wave your hands, I'll try and spot you. There's nothing in the chat box at the moment. Has anybody got a question for Ian? Elizabeth, yes, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Thank you for that, Ian. Your fascination with detail has given us the most amazing tour around all your walks. Are you going to keep taking photos as we come out of lockdown to have a record of how we've completed this cycle? Well, I've, I've actually always taken phot photographs on my walks. You know, ever since I, I came here, I've been taking photographs and before that as well. And of course, I will continue to do that. I, I love the idea of, of keeping a record. And of course, when I post them on, on Facebook, people love them, actually. You know, they're always talking to me in the street about the photos and so on. Yes, I'll carry on. Don't worry about that. So we've, got a, so we've got a comment coming in on the chat. Julia says that she's really enjoyed seeing your photos during Ian, uh, during lockdown, sorry. <laughs> um, any more questions in the room? Anyone want to wave to get my attention? Oh, yeah, David, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Um, one thing I didn't recognise, Ian, was that um, standing stone that was being replaced that faces west. Where was that? Oh, you mean, you mean the march? Do you mean the march stone? Yeah. Well, th that march stone um, it stands quite close to the war memorial, as you probably know. In it, 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 one of one of the um, one of the stones that used to mark the boundary of something. I, what the boundary is or was, I don't know, of course. But vandals were actually knocking it down over and over again during the summer. So people kept on replacing it. On one occasion, I managed to catch them replacing it, which I thought was an important part of the record of what was happening, you know, in Celadag during the lockdown period, you know. There wasn't much social distancing there, by the way, was there, particularly? Yeah. 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 Super, thank you, Ian got another comment coming on the chat from Linda Thompson. Fabulous, Ian. Thank you from all of the mermaids. You've brought so much pleasure to so many people during such difficult times. You're all crackers though, you know, <laughs> Linda. <laughs> Elizabeth, Hello? are you trying to send me something? Sorry, so... Um, Anybody else got a question? Yes. Paul, yeah. Hi, Ian. Um, thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, overall, because we're basically a year now, what is your best memory or, or favourite photo of the year? Which one stands out for you? Well, I have to say that the photo that I thought was most amazing was that young boy actually jumping into the harbour. I thought yeah, that was but... really quite brilliant. But I, I also um, like the idea of the front doors. I, I've photographed all the front doors, you know, as I, as I walked through. And I kept on thinking, it's amazing, every door is completely different. You know, and people live behind these front doors. It's the nature of their front door, tell you something about them, you know. But, you know, there were so many things that, that, that I enjoyed. I mean, one of the things that I enjoyed more than anything else was getting to know the place. Be be beforehand, 
I didn't really know it. I was, I was going into nooks and crannies that I had never dreamt of going down before, you know? And so taking photographs of places I didn't know before, you know, I did something to my life, I think, in fact. And, and I tried to, you know, show these places to other people as well. I mean, some, some people who had lived in um, Anstruther and Saladike all their lives didn't know about the woodland walks. Yeah, you know, I didn't. Dami, for example, didn't know about the woodland walk, but she'd lived in all her life here, you know? You know so I was actually, you know, not only learning things myself, but I was actually showing other people as well, you know. And uh, uh, one of the other things that I did, I hadn't done it before. You know, I showed that photo of the Skeeth, Skeeth stone. I started walking over the fields. And I, I could, the, the reason I did it first of all was that I wanted to see what the Mayview Flats looked like from some distance away. Because when I first, first photographed the Mayview Flats, people said, haven't they been destroyed yet? Why haven't they been taken down yet? And so I actually went around and did a, did a, a number of photos from Mayview Flats as well, and then walked over the fields to see what they looked at, like from a distance. And that was when I came across the, the Skeeth Stone, you know. So saying which is the best photo, or which is the one I like the most, I can't really tell you, to be honest with you. Yeah. But it was nice actually seeing people and, and getting to know so many people. I mean, I, I've, I've gained so many new friends, you know, during this past year. It's unbelievable. I never thought that would happen to me, you know. I like your beard, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like yours. <laughs> 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 I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a follower in your footsteps. <laughs> yeah, it looks very good, oh, Paul. Thank I must say. Thank you. Thank you. Was that? Yeah. Bye. <laughs> the Kate's commented on the chat that she loved the photos of the the photo of the metal posts showing how design and quality has changed over the years. Oh yes. Yes, that was quite interesting. I mean, people were actually making comments that, that showed they were actually paying attention, you know. You know, because I actually was commenting on every photo that that I actually took. And they actually people actually liked the comments as well as the photo itself, you know. And, and I think that's quite important. If you take a photo, people want to know the context of when it was taken and so on. Uh, Leslie says really interesting talk. Thank you, Ian. Have we got any more questions in the room? Elizabeth, yeah. Can I just come back in and ask Ian to keep a, a lookout in the Silver Dykes where the four, I think you called them roundels, are meant yes. to look like capstans. That was the original intent. Oh, really? Oh, and that's... Each, each one is due to have an etching on it to show the connection of the land and the sea. So there'd be a plough and a fishing boat and so on, but they've not been completed yet. But maybe if you'd keep an eye on them, one day we'll see the completed capstans. I would, I would do that. I mean, your comment just now is typical of what was happening. I was learning so much from people actually sending comments to me, you know, and that was one of the major pleasures that I actually had, you know, learning about things. So good, good. Castons, what a good idea, Mensch, that's fantastic. <laughs> but not finished yet. No, I didn't know that. Something else I've just learned. Julia, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, Ian. Um, I was wondering if you had considered um, making a little booklet or something of your, published of your photographs and your stories together. And I was also wondering um, how the project kept you going throughout lockdown. Did it help you get out of the house? Was that your motivation? It certainly got me out of the house. I, I think there were, we were allowed to go for walks of some kind during lockdown. You know, you weren't actually required to stay at home all the time. And I was out every single day, you know, I, I, I didn't stay at 
home at all, you know. I, I, was, I think the, some of the walks I did were quite short, you know, going to uh, Soil Dyke Harbour, for instance. But uh, going through the woods, you know, I did four miles. I was actually worn out by the time I got back, you know, because the path, the Craw Hill, they used to Craw Hill Woods, I forget the name sometimes, walk through the Craw Hill Woods, but the path becomes very, very, very difficult. And I got to a point where I couldn't go forward and I couldn't come back either, which rather worried me because I hadn't told my son where I was going. And I hadn't got my iPhone with me either. So I actually clambered up a very steep bit, hanging on to rusty bits of equipment to get up to the top and then walk back from there. It was quite exciting. And I was hoping to get a cup of tea from friends of mine, but when I reached their place, they weren't there. So I had to walk another mile to get home. But regarding the idea of publishing, well, it's an idea, it's a lot of work doing things like that, you know. It's a lovely idea. If you wanted to help yeah, me, be, if you wanted to help me, that would be brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good, I mean, we, we did a, that record of people standing at their front doors really is a good historical record mm -hmm. of how people survived the lockdown, you know. All of them smiling, like, you know, like as the ones that I showed you did, you know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I really enjoyed them, thanks. Well, thank, I'm very pleased about that. I was, I was quite nervous about it. I wasn't sure if people would actually like what I gave to them, you know. Is Leslie still there? Leslie and I are going, due to go for a walk together at some stage, I think. Looks like Christine's got a question. Christine? I was just wondering, Ian, if you had deposited a copy of the record you made of people at their front doors during lockdown with the Borough Collection with Kevin Dunyon, because I think it, it's a very important record that you made. Yes, I, I, I think it's an important record. Um, certainly, uh, we had to be very careful about publishing it with, with names and, and addresses, incidentally. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. people didn't like the idea of being publicised in that way. Um, but certainly, it would be great to have it in the Borough, Borough Collection. I think so. I think it would yeah. be good. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we, our idea wasn't the first one. I, I think that some people in Lower Lago did it as well, you know. Mm -hmm. But of course, the way we did it was, was probably completely different. And I shouldn't forget Susan Innes as well, because Susan and I actually did this together, you know. Uh -huh. And incidentally, before, before we started doing it, she invited my son Clive and myself to some wonderful meals in her place. It was brilliant. <laughs> and so well presented. It was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. But, you know, the idea of getting to know people, that for me was one of the real major things, actually, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I met you through you meeting Elizabeth Biddle, really, because Elizabeth had lent me Connolly's book, or the oh, book right. she, Connolly. Oh, that's right, and she lent it to me as well. It was a most yeah. interesting book. And in fact, yeah. um, after, the, after that, I, I went and found his um, gravestone in mm -hmm. and so the West of yes. Churchyard, yeah? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, you could, I could hardly recognize the names on it though, it was very badly it, wrote. Yes, it's next to the one for the Reverend Hugh Scott. Yes. who was the minister, of course, and, and prior to Drill Halls being Drill yeah. Halls, the bottom hall was known yeah. as the Hugh Scott Hall, and they but, lie together in but the... But it was the quite, quite an interesting history of, of the time. I mean, he was, mm -hmm. quite an, he was quite an important fellow, wasn't he, in the area? He was, he, a bit he, of a philanthropist, locally. He, he, he was he, important in Saladike, in Anstra the Wester, Anstra the Easter, in mm -hmm. Kilrenny as well. And Creel, apparently, as and well. Creel. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't read my brief too. Excellent. There's a couple more comments come in on the chat, going back to what Elizabeth was saying about the capstans. David Bailey has said that he has one with a plough on it just outside his front door. And Lally, I hope I'm saying that right. So, well, um, oh, Lally. Hello, Lally. Minch, you're here. Good. Says that she found it really interesting, learned new things about the place and particularly liked the path with fossils. Thank you, Ian. Are there any more questions for Ian? Well, if not, I'm going to suggest that everybody unmutes themselves and we thank Ian with a big round of applause and then we can carry on chatting for a bit if anybody wants to. If everybody could unmute themselves. Thank you very much, Ian. That was wonderful. Thank you.